Transformer de sorte que nous devenions des disciples centrés sur le Christ. Amen. Wallame Petra. Transformer nous. Pour force l'Esprit Saint. Baguhin mo kami at palakasin sa tulong ng Espiritu Santo. Amo te Marquez, dar besorat. Yisun ka wai tiu ding ding yan. Amen. What you just saw is the Alliance Vision Prayer in many different languages. And on this, the last day of our vision series, being a Mission Sunday, this is a missional vision that I'd like to speak with you about. As we are called by the Lord to share the good news of Jesus Christ, what we have experienced, we want others to experience as well. If there's something in your life that you experienced that was amazing and wonderful, say you went to a, 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 an amazing restaurant and you tasted some food there and it was like so great it blew your mouth away, you're going to tell everybody else about it. You've got to go to this restaurant, right? What about... If Jesus has made an impact on your life, would you not want to share that with others? On this Mission Sunday, I was reminded of Derek and Bonnie Burnett, who are our mission partners in, in Thailand. They were with us on home assignment last year. And I read on one of Bonnie's updates uh, recently, if you're not subscribed to their updates, I would encourage you to do so. She uh, wrote something, and then I wrote back to her and I said, hey, Bonnie, can you give me some more information? And she did, and then I asked her, can I share this with the rest of the church? And so this is what she said. She said, my grandparents with two of their children, so my grandparents, Jesse, that means that's your great grandparents we're talking about this morning, okay? My grandparents with two of their children spent World War II in a Japanese internment camp in Vietnam. Part way through the war, they had a chance to get on a ship and leave for the West. What would you do? Leave for the West? I know you're thinking it's a trick question, right? After prayer and discussion, they and a couple of other Alliance families decided to stay. They declared, quote, Jesus brought us to be his light to the Vietnamese. If we leave now, how will they know him? Can you imagine that? In that situation and in that circumstance, to choose to stay in an internment camp rather than try to escape. Her grandparents were Frank and Marie Irwin. Jesse, your great-grandparents chose to stay in an internment camp instead of coming back to Canada. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a testimony of God's faithfulness and God's goodness? And Bonnie went on to tell the rest of the story that uh, she said there was an interesting addendum to it is that the boat that ended up sailing away got captured again and ended up going to another internment camp in another country that was far worse than the internment camp that they were in. So for those people that chose to stay, it was actually a little bit better for them. Friends, this morning, as we talk about a missional vision, can we catch a vision? Can we understand what Jesus is calling us to, to live missionally in the world today? And as you saw our vision prayer for the Alliance, we are part of a larger family of churches all throughout the world that are united together on this one mission to be Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and mission-focused. And so let me start with big picture. We're part of a, a huge Alliance family that's called the Alliance World Fellowship. That's made up of 60 national church networks. So out of that 60, the Alliance Canada is one of them. There's 59 others. There's over 22,000 churches worldwide in 88 countries and over 6.2 million worshipers in all of those Alliance churches. And altogether, this, this stat actually blew me away, 184 theological schools around the world to train 
pastors and workers. Over 30,000 pastors and national workers around the world and over 1,000 international workers that are ministering in cross-cultural environments. That's the Alliance World Fellowship. That's part of what we are. The Alliance Canada is part of that larger network of, of churches seeking to share the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. Now, just here in Canada, our Alliance churches, there's 426 Alliance churches and congregations across Canada. More than 160,000 people are attending those churches. That's about 0.4 of 1% of Canadians. That's what our, our, our reach is right now. And at General Assembly this past year, our president challenged us, can we double our reach? What would it be like for the Alliance Canada to reach 1% of the population in Canada and make a difference in the lives of many people? More than this past, uh, they, they worship in 19 different languages, all these many different ethnic churches across the country. More than 3,600 3, baptisms this past year, 8,400 professions of faith this past year. How amazing is that? 51 new expressions of church and communities through New Ventures. So New Ventures is the alliance branch that speaks, uh, that speaks into planting churches or new expressions of churches or various ways in which church can take place out of the box sort of initiatives as well. We're working on one that I hope to tell you about in a, in a, in a few weeks time. 188 international workers ministering to 65 different people groups in 33 different countries. And out of that, 16 of those countries are on the world watch list for some of the most persecuted nations in the world. Isn't that amazing? That we get to be part of such a denomination, such a movement that prays and seeks after Jesus and wants to be spirit-empowered, mission-focused, and Christ-centered. That's what our prayer is. That's what our, our desire is. We want to see Jesus exalted and glorified in the world today so that many would come to know the saving grace of Jesus. If we have experienced such an amazing love, if we have experienced such amazing transformation because Jesus in, is in our lives, why would we not want to share that with everyone else? And so this is the Alliance Vision Prayer, which was the video that you just saw before I came up. But can we pray this together right now? And... Let's, let's invite the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to empower us for this. So can you pray with me? Oh God, with all our hearts, we long for you. Come, transform us to be Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, mission-focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere. And that last part is what I want to speak to you about this morning. Mission-focused, multiplying disciples everywhere. How can we multiply disciples everywhere? Just as I read that story from Bonnie and Jesse and Gemma's great-grandparents that decided to stay in Vietnam and share the love of Christ because they said, if we leave, who will tell them? There's so many places around the world where people don't know the name of Jesus, don't know the love of Jesus, don't know the truth of the gospel, and we get the opportunity to partner with Jesus on that amazing mission. Part of what we do here as, at, at the Alliance Canada is, to, is an offering called the Jaffrey Offering. Every year, it goes towards investing into indigenous workers, particularly uh, in these last couple of years in Asia, so that they can share the love of Jesus in all of those places. So I want to just show you a video from our president, Darren Herbold, uh, talking about the Jaffrey offering for this year. So take a look at the screen. Our spiritual forefathers sacrificed to bring the gospel to the nations. They believed, and so do we, that the proclamation of the good news to every tribe, tongue, and nation is the highest priority of the church. We can see it in the very roots and beginnings of our movement. In the late 19th century, when immigrants flooded New York City, A.B. Simpson left behind the pulpit of his prestigious church in order to proclaim the gospel to the masses. He inspired believers to become missionaries, to sell everything they had, and even buy tickets in steerage so that they could minister to the poorest of the poor in transit. Now, over 130 years later, we're still committed to preach Christ and to make him known in the hard places. 
And we're aiming again to raise $500,000 to plant churches, to train pastors, and mobilize workers to the least reached places on earth. Approximately $3,000 supports one pastor for a year in South Asia, allowing them to receive biblical education and discipleship in the context of community. When their training ends, they go out and plant on average of five churches in five years as they work towards self-sustaining ministry. So it's like a tree that is continuously producing more other fruit, eventually becoming like an orchard. And we have literally thousands more church planters willing and ready to serve the Lord. Additionally, we're supporting local pastors in the Arabian Peninsula this year, home to one of the most persecuted churches in the world. And listen to this, also one of the fastest growing churches in the entire region. These believers are under constant threat of jail, abuse, death, yet they are faithful to the call of Jesus on their lives and eager to be trained to share the gospel in their context. Friends, please consider partnering again, or perhaps for the first time, with these believers to make Jesus known in some of the most difficult places in the entire world. We're partnering with, in the Jaffrey Project, uh, our missions committee has already committed to give $5,000 so to train about two church planters so that they could plant five churches in five years. If you feel moved and led of the Lord to give, you can give to our missions fund and just put on their Jaffrey Project, and that'll go as well in addition to the 5000 that we're giving already as a church to be able to invest into church planters. And uh, this past, uh, a couple of months ago when we had our general assembly, we were inspired and we, were, uh, we are committed to doubling our reach and to reaching the unreached all over the world. And I want to say I'm going to share a few things uh, this morning that has come out of our Alliance Assembly. So I do want to give credit to Darren, who is our president, and Shayla Visser, who is the National Director of Alpha Canada, and Josie, who you saw on the screen just moments ago, who's our mission partner in Asia, pl uh, seeking to plant 500,000 churches by 2030. Um, and I'm taking some information from all of them and trying to present to you a missional vision I believe that God has here for us locally at Unionville Alliance Church in order to reach the nations for Jesus. And God has in, in many ways put this burden on my heart as well because I would love to see Unionville Alliance Church mobilized because the nations have come to us. Now, we don't necessarily have to go to other countries, although we, certain people do have to, to be able to share the good news of Jesus, but we live in the most multi-ethnic, multicultural area in the whole entire world. Toronto, the GTA region, is the most multi-ethnic place in the world, and the nations have come to us. And we have this amazing opportunity that we can share the love and grace of Jesus Christ with our neighbors, with our co-workers, with our friends, with those people that we come into contact with. And some of you are already doing that. We have over 70 people registered for Alpha. Week three is coming up. People exploring. Many of them are, are, are seekers searching for something more, searching for who is Jesus and how, what kind of impact he can have on their lives. And friends, we have this amazing opportunity to make an impact for the gospel. Jesus' missional mandate that we read there in Matthew chapter 28, and I started, we, uh, Doug read from, the, from verse one because I wanted to put in context where Jesus' missional mandate came in. It came in starting from the resurrection of Jesus because Jesus' missional mandate is rooted in the hope of resurrection. The whole reason why we can share about the love and grace of Jesus and what Jesus has done and the hope of eternal life is because Jesus died and not only died, but he also rose again. In the Gospel of Matthew 28, at the beginning portion of that chapter, the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid. He said, I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Jesus rose again from the dead. He conquered the grave. He conquered the enemies. He conquered every spiritual battle. And now because he is alive, he gives us a hope that we can share with other people as well, a hope that goes beyond this life, a hope that goes beyond the grave, a hope that goes on into eternity. 
And so friends, we can't have anyone on the sidelines. We can't have anyone just sitting back and relaxing. Each and every person needs to be involved and engaged in the mission of God to share the good news of Jesus Christ around the world until all know the love of Jesus and the transformative work that he can have in each and every one of our lives. Paul says that if Jesus didn't rise again, then our preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. Everything that we do is in vain. Me standing here today is in vain if Jesus didn't rise again. But thanks be to God, he did rise again. Last, uh, last Easter, we looked at some of the evidences of Jesus rising again from the dead and why there's his, this historical evidence for that. We can take confidence and hope in the resurrection of Jesus. Paul said, and if Christ is not being raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. But thanks be to God that our faith is not in vain because Jesus has risen again from the dead. And it gives us an opportunity to share with others the love of Jesus and the power of Jesus to rise again from the dead. Timothy Keller in his book, The Reason for God, as he outlines various reasons for God, an intellectual understanding of creation and the existence of God, he says this, after the death of Jesus, the entire Christian community suddenly adopted a new set of beliefs that were brand new and until that point had been unthinkable. The first Christians had a resurrection-centered view of reality. Friends, it for, for a whole set of beliefs to radically transform a group of people often takes generations. But instantly, after Jesus rose again from the dead, these early Christians, the early disciples, they adopted this new worldview. It was a resurrection-centered worldview that radically changed the way they lived their lives and radically changed the way they died as well because they were willing to die for the truth knowing that there was a hope of resurrection. They were willing to give up their own life realizing that this is not the end. Jesus died and rose again and therefore I also can rise again. Number two, Jesus' missional mandate requires faith. In the world today, there's a lot of skepticism. There's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of unbelief. And let me tell you, that is amazing and wonderful because we have a story to share to the doubts, to the doubters, to the skeptics, and to those that are seeking. We have an amazing opportunity to share the truth of the gospel even early on in Matthew 28, when they saw him, his own disciples, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. You might be here today and you're worshiping the Lord and you're thanking the Lord and you're praising the Lord, but inside your heart, you might be doubting. Lord, why is this happening to me? Why is the circumstance in my life? Why is the situation uh, going on? There might be some doubts. There might be some of those things, but God calls us to have faith in him. God calls us to believe in him. And he gives us a hope of the resurrection so that we can trust in him. In the, book, uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we see that there's this work of the enemy that is trying to blind the minds of, uh, of people, to try to take away belief in Jesus and instead put doubt and unbelief and skepticism and cynicism into people's hearts. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message of the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. That's why God has called us to be his ambassadors. God has called us to partner with him, that we can be co-laborers with Christ to explain the beauty of Jesus, to talk about the mysteries of the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus Christ far and wide and close at home as well. God has given us this amazing privilege. We live in such a, 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 a doubt-filled world, a, such a skeptic-filled world. Atheism has been growing. The, the new atheist um, uh, movement has been growing as people are, are, are denying the existence of God and coming to a worldview that is atheistic in nature. And I want to sh uh, share with you a quote from one, one famous atheist, Ayana Hari Ali, she, was, she came out of Africa, and, and some of the new atheists like Richard, um, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, maybe some of those names are familiar to you. These are prominent atheists that are, are pushing a worldview that is anti-God. And Ayana Hari Ali, she was one of them as well. But through her examination of life and questions, and as she started seeking, she found hope in Jesus. How amazing is that? 
and she became a Christian. Christopher Hitchens said that, that she was probably one of the most, uh, the most um, well-known public intellectual coming out of um, uh, Africa. And she decided to put her faith in Jesus. She said this, I have also turned to Christianity because ultimately I found without any spiritual solace, un, uh, unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question. What is the meaning and purpose of life? And thankfully for those, if you are registered for Alpha, if you're journeying through that, that's one of the big questions that we're looking at in Alpha. What is the meaning and purpose of life? Why are you here? Why, what purpose does God have for you in this world? And I hope that I can answer that question in part today by giving us a missional vision for God, what God wants us to do with our lives in sharing the love and grace of Jesus so that all people in all nations, in all languages, in all tribes, and in all ethnicities, in all places, might know the love of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to do that? God needs everyone on mission. We need everyone on mission. We need everyone. No one can be on the sidelines. Number three, Jesus' missional mandate was given to young people. And I don't know if you understand this completely, but Jesus, historians can say that Jesus was probably around 30 years old when he started his ministry, probably died around 33. And most of the disciples were probably between the ages of 13 to 30. More than likely, more of them were teenagers. And there's different things you can look at. For example, there's a story in the Bible of Peter uh, uh, one asking Jesus about paying the temple tax. And Jesus tells Peter, go, go fishing, and, op- and with the fish that you catch, open it up, you'll find some coins in there. Pay, use that to pay the tax for you and for me. What about the other disciples? Jesus wasn't caring about the other disciples? Well, during that time, the temple tax was only being paid for those that were 20 years old and older. So possibly, I can't say for sure, possibly Peter, being, he, was the, he was the only one that we know of that was married, possibly Peter was over, over 20 and maybe the other disciples were under 20. When Jesus called James and John, they were still with their father, fishing, still part of the family business. We don't know exactly their age, but, more, but probably they're between 13 and 30. So if you think about it, Jesus committed the most important message in all of history Jesus committed the most significant message that he wanted to communicate to all people to a bunch of teenagers and people in their 20s and said, go and and share. Go and spread the gospel. I want to encourage our church to, to unleash our young people to do the will of God. That don't think of them as too young Because if Jesus thought that way about his disciples, he would not have committed the most important message to them, to share all around the world. He left it up to them. He said, go and wait for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and then take that message and share it all over to all people in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. He committed that message. And I want to tell also the young people, if you're here and you're a teenager or you're in your 20s, I want to tell you that God has an amazing plan and purpose for your life, and he doesn't want you to waste your time away. I want to encourage you to get engaged in the mission of God. I want to encourage you not to sit on your laurels and not to just sit back and enjoy whatever the world has to give, but to be engaged in what Jesus has for you. How can you be engaged in the mission of God? There's so many uh, different things that young people can get involved in, and it's up to us as well as the church and as uh, older generations to unleash them, to trust them, to empower them, to encourage them, to speak into them, to help them to go forward in the mission of God. How are you investing in in the next generation? You know, we've never been a university church as some other churches are when they're closer to universities, uh, they have a lot of young people maybe coming because they're close to a university and they're considered like a university church. We're not a university church. We never have been. Actually, we're the complete opposite of that because when our young people get universities, they go far away and then they come back afterwards. But do you know what has happened this year? York University has moved into our backyard. They are 10 minutes away from us. York University Markham campus that just started this year is 10 minutes away from us. What are we going to do about that? 
I, I, I talked to Pastor Justin about that recently to think about what is our strategy? What are we going to do so that we can reach the nations through university students? There's so many, 50% of world leaders are educated in Western countries. And about 90% of them won't have a significant relationship with another Christian. We have an amazing opportunity when the nations are coming to us and international students are coming to us that they might have never heard the story of Jesus. They might have never experienced the love of God. And we get the opportunity to be able to share that with them. What are we going to do? Because York University is in our backyard now. How are we going to make an impact? If you have an idea, if you have an inspiration, please talk with Pastor Justin. We need to do something. I don't know what it is, but we need to do something. There was a survey recently that was, uh, that was taken, a Canadian survey, that said 12% of the people in Canada over a seven-day period went to church. So out of all the 41 billion, uh, million people in Canada, in a seven-day period, so one-week period, 12% said that they went to church. But here's the shocking statistic that you might not realize, that you might think, oh, the younger generation, no, they don't care about Jesus, oh, they're not following the Lord. When you just examine the age group of those that are under 30, that percentage goes up from 12% up to 18%. Do you know what that means? That means that young people are coming back to church. Can we empower the next generation? Can we speak into them? Can we bless them? Can we invest into them? Can we be there? Uh, for those that are of a different generation, can we be there to invest into our young people? Because they are looking. They are searching. Here's another amazing statistic. 45% of no faith Gen Z have no opinion of Jesus. This is amazing. 45% of people in Gen Z that say they have no faith have no opinion of Jesus. How amazing is that? Because we get to tell them the story of Jesus. Let me show you this. This is part of a Canadian study. Okay? You can see this is Gen Z. I want to see the, on the bottom right, the last bubble on the bottom right. Can you see that? It says 45%. The left-hand side is all the good characteristics of Jesus. The right-hand side are negative things, perceptions about Jesus. The bottom right says 45%. That's people that have no faith background, and they're saying none of the above. I, don't, I, I won't say anything about Jesus positive, and I won't say anything about Jesus negative. Well, guess what? We have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with that 45% of Gen Z. Isn't that amazing? We have an opportunity to be able to tell them how Jesus loves them, how Jesus cares for them, how Jesus wants to make a difference in their lives, how Jesus can touch them and transform them and, and bless them in so many amazing ways. But look at this as well. On the top it says there, he offers hope to people. 26% of no faith people believe that Jesus offers hope to people. 20% of no faith Gen Zers say he cares about people. How amazing is that? That's a huge percentage of people that already are coming in with a positive outlook on Jesus. All they need is one person to talk to them. Can you be that one person? All they need is one person to make a difference in their life. Our vision statement is to touch our world through Jesus, one life at a time. Can you be that one person that makes a difference in the life of a young person? Can you be that one person that shares the love and grace of Jesus Christ? Friends, the, the, the data speaks for itself. We are living in the most spiritually open generation ever. We are living in the most spiritually open generation ever. People are open to hearing the good news of Jesus. We just need to co-labor with Jesus to share that. He wants to use us as ambassadors, as willing vessels for the glory of God. Number four, Jesus' missional mandate is cross-cultural. We are so blessed here at Unionville Alliance Church because we, are, we represent the beauty of heaven with so many different ethnicities and cultures and countries and languages and so many of those things. But Jesus' uh, missional mandate is cross-cultural. He said, therefore, go and make disciples in Unionville? No. No. Go and make disciples of all nations. 
And so we can go, like the Derek and Bonnie Burnett's and, and other international workers that we support, we can go to those other nations, and God calls some people to go to those other nations. But as I said before, we are living in such a unique location in all of the world where the nations have come to us. The nations have come to us. Unreached people groups around the world are represented here in the Toronto GTA area. And we get the opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. Look at some of the stats here in Canada. You can see here, this is immigration. Number of immigrants in Canada from 2000 to 2023. 2022 and 2023, you see that spike. There's so many people that are coming into into Canada right now. Now, I'm not trying to be political or anything like that and all the different politics behind immigration. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about an opportunity that Jesus is giving us. An opportunity. A silver platter and saying, here are unreached people groups from around the world coming to your neighborhood. Can you tell them about Jesus? Are you with me? Can we catch this missional vision to see that God is calling us to be his ambassadors? And you can do that right here where you live because the nations have come to us. If you look at this next uh, graph, you can see, I know it's hard to read, but that blue line that's the biggest, 25 to 29-year-olds. This is immigration as well that's coming into Canada. The biggest line there is 25 to 29-year-olds in 2023 that's coming into Canada. Can we invest in the next generation? So what can we do? I want to give you a few things that we as a church, Unionville Alliance Church, if you call Unionville Alliance Church your home church, if this is the community that you fellowship in, if this is the place where you find hope, the place where you find the message of Jesus, the place that you're edified, the place where you serve, the place where you give, I want to encourage you in seven ways as I close. Seven ways of what we can do to be able to live missionally. Number one, no surprise here, pray. Pray, and then pray some more. Pray, and pray, and pray some more. Friends, we are called to prayer. We are called to pray. Pray for those people that are coming to our front doors. Pray for the 70 plus people coming to Alpha. Pray for the immigrants that are coming to our nation. Pray for the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Pray so that Christ might be exalted and others might know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter four, Paul says this, devote yourselves to prayer. I'll read that from the beginning again. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us that God would give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim the message as clearly as I should. Paul, who is being persecuted, who is in chains, who is in prison, what is his number one burden? Not that he exits out of the persecution, not that the chains are loosened, not that he gets out of prison. His number one priority that he tells the people to pray for, that he tells the church in Colossae to pray for, is pray that I might make the gospel clearly known to everyone around me. That is the priority. That is the goal. That is the eternal vision. That is the kingdom of God coming here on earth as it is in heaven. That is us being ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Paul gave the example right there. It was like, I'm being persecuted. And it wasn't the prisons like prisons here today where you get your meal and you can watch TV and go into the exercise room and be fit. No, these are prisons that are dirty and stinky and rats and insects going all over the place and no proper hygiene. And Paul is not concerned about leaving that place. He is concerned about the thousands of people that are around him that don't know Jesus. And he says, if you're going to pray for something, don't pray for my release, but pray that Jesus would be known to the people around me. Are we praying like that? Or what is at the top of our prayer list? What is at the top of our priority list? Friends, brothers, sisters, can I encourage you to catch a missional vision of what Jesus is doing? Number two, mature in Christ. For those that have been walking with Jesus for some time, I want to encourage you. We're starting a series next week called Practicing the Way. 
And this is going to be a challenging series. It's going to be a series that's going to challenge you to dig deep into your life. It's going to be a series that's going to challenge you to examine why are you following Jesus and what are you doing following Jesus and how can you change so that you can actually mature in the way of Jesus and grow in the way of Jesus to be a disciple, to grow as a disciple, and to make disciples. And so I want to encourage you to mature in Christ. There's many times that we are actually very immature in Jesus and our priorities have totally lost its place. Paul says this to the church, uh, to to the uh, the Hebrews that were scattered. He says this, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Are any of us in that situation? That we've known Jesus for many years that now we should be teaching others, sharing the gospel with others, helping others. But he says for them, instead, you need something to teach you again. Someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. And that's a pretty hard hard letter, right? What if you receive that? Right? What if Daniel wrote a letter to the church in uh, Unionville Alliance? You guys are a bunch of babies. Come on. (laughs) What what, what would you think? You'd be writing a letter to Johnny after that probably, right? (laughs) But look at the words that Paul is using here. Because he sees and knows and has the burden in his heart for all the world to know Jesus. For all the world to know. And Paul knows you can't, he couldn't have anyone on the sidelines. He couldn't have anyone just just hanging out and not doing anything and just being like children. He wanted them to mature in Christ so that they could go out and share the gospel. He wanted them to be teachers so that they could teach the way of Jesus. And so that many more would come to know Jesus. We're starting our life groups next week. If you're not in a life group, I want to encourage you to join a life group. This next two-month study comes with a video curriculum and a workbook. And if you're not in a life group and you're not ready to join a life group, we're going to have another group that's just working through that that two-month curriculum, practicing the way of Jesus, so that we can grow in our maturity for Jesus. So if you want to join that, speak to Pastor Leonor. She'll get you in that group. If you're not part of another life group, we want to go deeper in our walk with Jesus. Invest and unleash the next generation. Invest and unleash the next generation. There's so many times when we we tend with the younger generation and say, oh, but what if they mess up? What if they do this? Or what if they, don't worry about that. Just invest and unleash. Give them boundaries. Give them instruction. Give them guidance. Give them mentorship. Give them hope. Give them empowerment. Invest in them and unleash them and see what they'll do. That's what Jesus did for the disciples. He invested into them for three and a half years, and then he unleashed them to the world. And look at what they did. Can we invest and unleash the next generation? Empower them. Speak into them. Can I encourage you that if if you're in an older generation, can you take time to mentor someone? Can you take time to encourage someone? Can you take time maybe to take, take a young person out for a meal? and speak into them, encourage them, invest into them, bless them, help them? How are you investing into the next generation? How are you speaking into the lives of the next generation? Invest into them, unleash them, and let's see what God will do through them. Paul uh, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Paul invested into Timothy. And then he told Timothy, now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Paul invested into Timothy, and then he empowered him and sent him out. And then Timothy was supposed to teach others as well. Let's invest and empower the next generation. Not just the next generation. I want, I want us to encourage and empower the retirees. Any of, any of those in here? In the house? Encourage and empower the retirees. One of the things we'll be looking at in this next series is a little bit of uh, Pete Scazzaro wrote this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. You can't be spiritually mature if you're emotionally unhealthy. And that's, that's the case with many people. Emotionally unhealthy, therefore, can't become spiritually mature. And if you found yourself in that situation, two steps forward, once, one step forward, two steps back, failure, failure, I can't go on. Why am I in this, in this situation? I, again, I want to encourage you just to commit yourself in the next two months as we study this series, Practicing the Way of Jesus. But Pete Scazzaro, who, who wrote that book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, he said this. He said, your, your 60s are going to be the best decade of your life. 
your, seven, your, your, uh, your 50s are going to be the next best decade, and then your 70s are going to be the, the third best decade of your life. Do you know why? Because if you've been walking with Jesus for some years, and you're growing, and you're changing, and you're maturing, then when you get to your 60s, you're probably in a time frame where you're probably, not everyone, this is just generalization, you're probably a little bit more mature than you were when you were in your 20s, hopefully. <laughs> All right, no guarantee. You're probably a little bit more financially independent than you were when you were in your 20s or 30s, or have a little bit more financial stability. You might have a little bit more time because you might be semi-retired or fully retired, wherever that might be. And hopefully, more than maybe 70s or 80s, hopefully you still have a decent amount of health as well left. And you can do so much for Jesus. You could do so much for Jesus. If you're in your 60s, can I encourage you and challenge you? This might be, sometimes people say, oh, well, yeah, the prime of your life is in your 20s or in your 30s. Guess what? The prime of your life, 60s. Jesus can use you in so many amazing and wonderful ways to mentor others, to go out to other countries, to use the gifts and talents that you have developed over decades. Kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Can I challenge you, if you're in your 60s, if you're in your 70s, if you're in your 50s, don't just look to retirement that I'm just going to sit back and relax. Don't just look to retirement that, okay, I've worked hard all of these years, but worked hard for what? And now it's time for me to relax? No. The 60s could be the best decade of your life. The 70s could be the best decade of your life as you intentionally invest in kingdom initiatives, as you intentionally invest into the kingdom of God and into the will of God. Remember, we only have a short time here in this world. We only have a few years in this world in comparison to the millions and millions of years in eternity with Jesus. So let's do whatever we can here in this world. Let's do whatever we can with whatever time and energy and strength that we have. In the book of Joshua, we read about a man named Caleb. I won't read all the verses, but in Joshua 14, he talks about Caleb because God gave Caleb a promise that because he stayed faithful to the Lord, he would give him the promised land. And then years later, this was when Caleb was around 40, in his 40s, and years later when they finally came to conquer the promised land, Caleb came to Joshua and said, Joshua, do you remember what Moses said about you and about me, how he was going to let us come into the promised land because we stayed faithful to his word? Now it's the time. I'm going to co conquer the promised land. I am 80 five years old now, and guess what? I'm as strong as I was before. Give me the land that God has for me. Can we be bold? Can we invest and empower and encourage the retirees to go out and accomplish the mission of God, to live missionally with intentful purpose so that the kingdom of God can be established, so that the good news of Jesus Christ can be known? You have no idea how much wisdom, maturity, talent, ability, grace, patience, all of these different things that God has formed in you and shaped in you and transformed you over decade after decade of walking with Jesus, and he is looking for a return on that investment. If you put 10 bucks into the bank today, do you want 10 bucks coming back to you 50 years from now? No, all right? You don't want that. If Jesus has invested into you over and over and over again and invested and invested, he's looking now for the return on investment. How can he use you for his purpose and his glory? My brothers and sisters, you are gifted. You are talented. You are, are children of the most high God that he wants to use as tools in his hand to make his will become here on earth as it is in heaven. We want to empower you to do God's will. Next, use your business, your talents, and skills for gospel fulfillment. Whatever business that you have, for those of you here that are, that are, are working in various professions or own businesses or whatever it might be, in whatever situation you are, do you know that God wants to use your business, your talents, and your skills for gospel fulfillment? Right now, the best thing because to go into unreached places, places where Christ is not known, Somebody like a missionary or a pastor might not be able to go there because of rules and regulations and visas, but business people can go there. 
And do you know that you can be just a light of Jesus in that place? Here in, here in, uh, in Canada, you can go to the gas station and maybe bump into another Christian. But there are some places around the world that you could go to a gas station, you can go to the store, and you might never see another Christian. What if Jesus wants you to be that Christian in that country so that you can be the light of Jesus and share the love and grace of God with others? Use whatever skills God has given to you. If you're, if you're an engineer, if you're a teacher, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, whatever it might be, God can use that for his purpose and glory. The nations have come to us, but there's still a call to go out to the nations as well. In Matthew 25, it says, the master was full of praise. This is, talk, this is a parable of the talents. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Do you know God wants to give you rewards in eternity? Do you know God wants to give you responsibility in eternity? Do you know God wants to commit into your hands? It's not just about sitting on clouds with a halo on top for all of eternity. It's not what it's about. There's work to be done in eternity, and he wants to give you responsibility towards that as well. Lean into the empowerment of the Spirit. Lean into the... None of this can happen. All of these different things, missional living, none of this can happen without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So lean into the empowerment of the Spirit. Not by our own power, not by our own works, not by our own wisdom, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1, you will receive power, empowerment, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We have a story to tell. We have a message to give. We have good news to share to people. Let's be empowered by the Spirit to do that. And lastly, step out in faith and do hard things. Most things that are easy are not worth doing. Most things that are hard are worth doing. So step out in faith and do hard things. Because it's going to be difficult. The task is enormous. There are billions of people that don't know anything about Jesus. But Mark Zuckerberg, in 20 years, reached over 3 billion people. There are over 3 billion active Facebook users around the world in 20 years. The task is not impossible. The problem is we're lacking vision. We're lacking zeal. We're lacking understanding to know what God is calling us to do. How about you today? Will you respond? Will you do the hard thing? Or are we just more comfortable to say, Daniel, I... I like my home in Markham. I like what I'm doing here. I, this, is all, this is all a little bit too much for me. It's not my message. This is the message of the gospel. This is the reason why Jesus came. It's the reason why Jesus touched your life. Do you remember that question I asked before? What's the meaning and purpose of life? It's a complicated question. But one aspect and one part of it is that you might be touched with the love of Jesus and experience transformation through the grace of God, so that you can share that with others as well. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, Moses, encouraging Joshua, said, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Friends, do hard things. Be courageous. Do hard things. Do you know there's, only, there's two things that you can't do in eternity? You know what they are? Two things you can't do in heaven. Right? One, can't tell people about Jesus. Right? You can't tell people about Jesus. He's there. He's everywhere. You can, you, can I tell you a little about Jesus? I, I met him. Yes, yeah, I just met him. You can't tell people about Jesus in eternity. So let's use whatever strength and power and talent and ability and, and whatever God fills us with and empowers us with to tell everybody we can about Jesus here. Because we only have a certain number of years to tell people about Jesus. And the second thing you can't do, you can't love, support, and care for the poor, hungry, or hurting. Because in heaven, there's no more suffering, there's no pain, there's no more crying. All tears will be wiped away. You can only do that here on earth. 
So can I join the two together? And can I encourage you? Go to the poor. Go to the hungry. Go to the hurting. Go to the disenfranchised. Go to those that don't know. And share the love of Jesus. Go to those that don't know and tell them what Jesus has done for you. Jesus has done amazing things for us. And sometimes you might think, well, it's a little bit difficult. I love this quote by Daryl Johnson. He says this, evangelism is joining a conversation that the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. You don't got to start it. He's already started it. There's something that's going, if he's inspiring you and saying, go and speak to this person, go and talk to this person, guess what? He's probably already, not probably, he's already started the conversation. There is something, because God is writing an amazing story. God is writing, and he uses us in one situation, and another person in another situation, and another person in another situation. And so when he moves you and challenges you and speaks to you to to do the hard thing, to go to the hard and dark places, to do the things that are, are out of your comfort zone, guess what? You're not alone, because at the end of the Great Commission was, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I will send my spirit upon you, and he will empower you, and he will be your comforter, and he will be your helper, and he's the one that's all already started the conversation with those people. You just got to join in. He's asking us to co-labor with him. He's asking us to proclaim. Worship team, please come. He's asking us to proclaim the gospel. I want to just read you a, a story as the worship team comes about the gospel going forth in China. The incredible testimony of how the metropolitan city of Wenzhou became synonymous with Christianity in China is due to a man with only one leg. Wenzhou has so many Christians that is often called the Jerusalem of China. Some estimate as many as 15% of the population is Christian, but our studies show that a number is even higher. The number of Christians in Wenzhou is almost six times higher than the national average. And those are just the Christians that are known. There are many Christians in underground house churches, uh, the underground house church movement that are not known and are not included in the official numbers. How did it happen? It all goes back to a man named George Stott in the 1800s, who God called to preach the gospel in China. He desperately wanted to attend Cambridge University, but God had other plans. When George lost his leg in a farming accident at the age of 19, it seemed that his life dreams were over until he met the famed Chinese inland mission, missionary Hudson Taylor. God called the one-legged Scotsman to the mission field. For most mission societies of the era, it was a preposterous idea to consider an amputee for service on the mission field. But Hudson Taylor was impressed. When Taylor asked George why he should even consider going to China, with only one leg? Do you know what his answer was? I don't see those with two legs going. (laughs) How about us? He said, I don't see people with two legs going, so I need to go, because I need to tell others about Jesus. Shall we all stand? Can I ask you, what will you do in response to this message? How will you share the love of Jesus to others today?